isn't maintained. But now we get his son. Ah, but his son is 60 years old when he gets on the throne. Right? So we've got this problem of what? the pharaohs and Egypt almost always goes downhill when the pharaoh lives too long. What's up, everybody? Back again. Another video on ancient Egypt. Our presenter is Professor Bob Breyer. And this is Great Courses, the History of Ancient Egypt. Great Courses has many, 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 many audiobooks. You can find the this one and others like it online, wherever you get your audio books. You can also find some of them in the library, in your local library. I, myself, choose to go to Amazon. But whatever is comfortable for you. We were talking about the, the last king's 13th son who became ruler of Egypt. Now, uh, just to clarify, I was under the assumption, I had to go over the information again, I was under the assumption that he turned 60 while he was in his reign. But from what I just heard, he was around about 60 when he got into his reign, when he started his reign. Why? Why would you wait so late in life? That's like I was I was listening to a YouTuber earlier today, and they were talking about. A matter of fact, it wasn't even so so much as a YouTuber. It was Eddie Griffin. I was watching one of his videos. I don't know if it was an old one or more recent, but he was talking about how. A lot of the politicians are like 60, 70 years old and they they are out of touch with young Americans. So how can they effectively lead the country when most of their friends are dead or either retired? And that makes sense. Unless you unless you communicate with the younger people to know what they're going through, know what their needs are. How can you relate? How can you relate? You can't. But anyway, let's continue. So what happens after the time? We get a mystery king. Amon Nessus. Rules for about two years now. Why do I call him a mystery king? He wasn't supposed to be king. Uh. Now, as you know, he became king by marrying the right woman. The heiress the pure royal blood flowing through her veins. It was matriarchal, right? Event matrilineal, and sometimes a queen could even rule, and it becomes matriarchal. And you'll see, that happens at the end of this dynasty. So we get Amenmesis, who is not the king's eldest son, who is usually the one who marries this right woman. Right? He's a son of Menepta, but he's not supposed to be king, and all of a sudden, boom, huh? he's king. A tomb in the Valley of the Kings. So there's no doubt he was ruling as king. But we don't know much about him. He succeeded by Seti II, probably his brother. Now, what does Seti II do? The first thing he does is erase Amon Messus' name wherever he finds it. Damn. Now, why would a king do that? Well, there are some reasons. One theory, and it's just a theory, is that Seti II is the king, he was supposed to be king, he's the prince who was supposed to be king, and then maybe Amon Mesa somehow you know, pushed him aside or something like that, but it's yeah. clear he doesn't like him. So he erases his name. Now, this was common in Egypt, by the way, pharaohs erasing the names of predecessors. Common. It was, it's an interesting practice. They did it for two reasons. One was when you really wanted to erase all traces of anyone. Damn. He would, see, the Egyptians didn't have a concept of heaven and hell. They just had heaven, the next world. The worst thing that could happen to you is if you went out of existence. Right? There was no place. 
place where you went for eternal torment? No. You went out of existence. That was the worst. Even, for example, in the Book of the Dead, when you're being judged to see if you're worthy. If you're not worthy of going to the next world, they just take your heart out and throw it to this creature who's a devourer of hearts and you go out of existence. So, one reason was, if you hated your predecessor, for some reason, you would erase his name wherever it existed. And to erase the name, you erased him. He no longer existed. That's what happened, remember, at the end of Tutankhamun's reign? When you had the Herod, Heretic Pharaoh, his father, Akhenaten, and everybody associated with that was annihilated from the records. Right? So, I think that's probably why Seti does this. The other reason why you might erase another pharaoh's name and replace it with yours is you wanted to take credit for his monument. Ramses the Great was called the Great Chiseler. Why? <laughs> because he erased everybody else's name. Not because he hated them. He wanted to take credit for all the monuments. So, for example, we get statues that were 100 years old during Ramses' time with his name on it. He would take a statue, carve out the previous pharaoh's name, and put his. And the idea was kind of like, when the gods looked down, they would see this statue, and they would see it has Ramses' name, and they would credit Ramses. You know, they could look down and look at the statue, but they wouldn't look down and see that Ramses was carving out somebody else's name. You know, it's, it's, it's an interesting concept, but that's why people did this all the time in Egypt. It makes it very difficult for Egyptologists, just because you find a statue with somebody's name on it doesn't mean it's of him. Very often we know it's not. So Seti comes in, eradicates his brother's name. Now, Seti had three queens. Two of them are going to be important for us. We're coming to the end of the dynasty. We're coming to the end. There's only going to be two more rules. But he has three queens of whom two are important. Now remember, please, that there were three relationships a woman could have with regard to the pharaoh. Great wife. That was only one at any one time. She was the honcho of the harem. Then there was queens. Right? Who were kind of married. They were a wife married to the... Which could be a concubine. Right? So, three relationships. So he has three queens. Three wives, so to speak. Right? Now, one... One Tia. wife, mistress, and a girlfriend. She's going to be the mother of the next king. And another one, Tauseret, is going to actually rule Egypt. Right? So Seti's got some interesting women around him. Interesting. But he built his own monuments. Seti built a chapel at Karnak. And let me tell you about this chapel. The Karnak Temple was the largest religious building in the history of the world. Kermit. Huge. For thousands of years, each pharaoh went to this place and added his own temple. Don't think of it as one temple. It doesn't make any sense, the, 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 the plan. You can get lost in Karnak Temple. Because it's Ramses' buildings, Seti's buildings, Seti II's buildings, right? Everybody had it. This was sacred ground. This was the Vatican of Egypt. <laughs> and Seti II. It's amazing that he would say that the Vatican of Egypt because everything he's talking about, if you really think about what he's saying and the way he's saying it, everything he's talking about is before, comes before the modern era. Before the Vatican had amassed all that wealth and power, there was Egypt. Before Congress, before kings, what we know as kings and queens and the royal families, there was Egypt. And even before Egypt, there was Kush, not the we, the, the people, the state, Kushites. A lot of the Kushites helped make Egypt great. Through, through correspondence and traveling back and forth, selling, buying goods. So, Egypt, in its heyday, was similar to 
America in a sense that at one time it was the greatest country on earth. It was the greatest place on earth. Medical, educational, philosophy, science, everything. Egypt was that place. And it just all fell apart. Damn. Oh, well. Goes to Karnak Temple. And he builds a special monument. A boat chapel. Now, let me explain what a boat chapel was. Remember in Thebes that the chief gods were Amun, Mut, and Hansen. Egyptian gods always came in trinities. Amun is the hidden one. Mut is his wife. And Hansen was their child. Well, at Karnak Temple, statues of these gods were kept. Festival times, and these statues were never seen by the commoners. Nah, they had kept in the back of the temple in the Holy of Holies. But at festival times, the statues were placed on portable shrines in the shape of a boat. These are pretty big boats. I mean, it's like about 20 feet long. And the boat shrine rested on poles, two poles. And during festivals, the priests, shaven-headed priests, ten on each side sometimes, would carry these poles on their shoulders. And they would parade the statues of the gods in front of the people. And for the first time in a long time, people could see the statues of their gods. It was a big deal. Now, Seti II builds a boat chapel. It has, it's a small temple. By small, it's probably 40 feet across, maybe. Mm -hmm. But it has three compartments. One for the boat of Amun, one for the boat of Mut, one for the boat of Khonsu. So, during festivals, the statues would be placed in the shrine. The boats would be taken out of the shrine and paraded for the people to see. Right? So that is his monument that we know he built at Karnak Temple. Then he dies. Then he dies. And he is succeeded by his son, Sipta, Ooh. who is the son of one of his wives, Tia. Sipta is an interesting mummy. We have his mummy. He's another one of those that was found in that royal cache. Mm. The foot is deformed. Probably from polio. Many people think that Sipta had polio. And the foot is deformed. And I think it's interesting that a pharaoh of Egypt could have a deformity. I mean, he became king of Egypt, no question about it. You know, Sipta's king of Egypt with a deformed foot. Could he lead the army? Well, from a chariot, perhaps. But it also may be a sign that Egypt is weakening, that they're, they're going to accept a, a pharaoh with a defect, with a birth defect, or, or a defect of any kind. But Sipta becomes king of Egypt. It doesn't reign long, maybe five years, something like that. And then it happens, the thing I mentioned. His stepmother, Tauseret, hmm. becomes ruler of Egypt. We don't know why. She is on the throne. We do not know why. Only two years. She even had a small tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Wow. Right, so she was definitely ruling. There was a separate little tomb for her jewelry. Quite interesting. They found silver gloves. Silver gloves. I don't mean the color. Silver gloves. And in it, were eight finger rings, beautiful finger rings. And so she had her jewelry hidden in a cache for eternity. But the 19th dynasty ends in this very strange way with a woman ruling Egypt. Oh, wow. Next time we'll see the consequences of what happens when a woman rules Egypt. I'll see you then. Huh. Stepson, stepdaughters, Chosen one, married one, three wives. They got a lot going on over there. Well, the next episode is a woman ruler. Oh, my goodness. Fellas. Fellas. Psst, psst, come here.
our women don't seem to understand. Women's live, women's rights, was because white women didn't have any rights. White women had problems getting respect from their men. But in our ancient society, women had just as much authority as men. And as we will see, even in the royal court, even in the royal court, there were female leaders. Now, I do know of one right off the bat, Hatcher said. I know she was a, 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 I don't even know what to call her, but she was the king and the queen. The phrase comes to the phrase that comes to mind is uh who wears the pants in the family? Yeah, it was definitely her. She was one day she wore the dress and the next day she was wearing the pants. Uh, uh we'll we'll get into that. We'll unpack that later. But uh thanks for stopping by. And I will talk to you later.